Hey guys, welcome to Karate 360. I'm Kalen Angloss. I'm Richard Mosdell. How's it going, everybody? Good to hear from back from you guys. Uh, welcome. This is episode two of the Karate 360 podcast. And before we get started, we just wanted to talk a little bit about a uh, little tournament that might be coming up here in, very shortly, actually. A little one. Massive tournament. Huge. Uh, we have the BC Open coming up December the 10th. Uh, in Richmond and Vancouver, and we also have the Canada Open coming June 3rd and 4th, 2017 at the Richmond Olympic Oval, also right beside Vancouver. This is going to be amazing. Um, everybody knows how great the organizers are and uh, those fantastic volunteers at the U.S. Open in Las Vegas in the spring. Um, we want to bring that same type of energy, uh, that same type of quality to Canada for something that Canadians and uh, Americans and people from around the world that come and uh, participate in whether you're seven years old and you've got your green belt and you're really keen on competition and you and your family have always wanted to see Vancouver in, in the beautiful summertime and see those amazing green mountains um, or you're an elite athlete and getting to the US Open maybe might not be uh, possible for you if you're coming from somewhere that's a little remote or you're, uh, that's not the time of year for you to get down this is it. The Canada Open is going to be for you. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be big. Uh, the U.S. Open itself is, is something I think that every karate athlete knows about and, and kind of shoots to go for as an international tournament if you're not obviously from uh, the U.S. But, I mean, having something like that in Canada, it's going to be awesome. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Um, I remember a long time ago I hosted the, the Vancouver Karate Cup, and um, it was a time when there wasn't a lot of tournaments on, on the West Coast. Um, and the last year we held it, there was almost 500 athletes there. Both We had people even come from England um, who are competing. We had people come from Japan just because we had Japanese friends. Um, and the opportunity to have both recreational athletes and lead athletes be able to compete um, together uh, and in our backyard, you know. And great for our friends down uh, on the other side of the border, down south. You know, they uh, they have that fantastic U.S. dollar. It makes it easier buying the Canadian funny money, as they call it. <laughs> uh, it's always neat to see uh, U.S. friends come up here and be amazed by the different colors of the money. Yes, and, yeah, it's and plastic. That. And there <laughs> yeah, and the, one of the great things uh, about the timing is uh, because it's the uh, first weekend of June, uh, it's just a great time to be in Vancouver. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, Vancouver is known for its rain. Yeah, <laughs> uh, even uh, in June. Even in June, yeah. but kind of is done by then. Yeah, you know, like yeah, November, sure. November to uh, April, it can be gray. Um, but May into June, now you're getting into some great weather. Yes, yeah. You know? And what's really amazing is how much people like to go to Whistler too recently. So definitely, yeah, Whistler's Whistler's booming. I think yes. so that's awesome. So Canada Open Karate Championships June third and fourth, two thousand seventeen. Um, and we're going to be talking about it. We're going to get more information out to everybody. So let's get started. Episode number two. Minasan, konnichiwa, genki desu ka. So let's throw a little Japanese story. I know our, our, we have got some really great friends who are listening in right now from y Tokyo and stuff. Y yes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> how are you? Yes. Uh, so, first off, how was your week? Well, you know me. Uh, uh, nothing happens in my week. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, the week's been incredible. Um, did another Karate Kid movie come out? Yeah, right? I mean, it, it's just everything's going crazy right now in the karate world. Everybody you talk to who's uh, who owns a karate club that I've talked to uh, this week uh, is having one of their best Septembers ever. That's crazy. Ever. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it, you know, the, uh, yesterday and today I had people come into the club, literally just put their credit card down on the desk and go, sign me up, sign yeah. up my kid, sign up my dog. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, we're kind of busy now. We can get you uniform. No, no, just take my credit card information. We'll be back next week. Just sign us up. Make sure there's a spot for us. Yeah. I've never experienced that before. It's crazy. It's crazy. For for me this week, um, obviously, school started up back in. So at yep. the University of Victoria, one of the professors that I have there, actually, whose son is, comes here uh, yep. to Kansas Sports Karate, he says, oh, I heard karate was in the, is back in the Olympics. Or not back. Yeah, you know, he, sorry, he did say back in the Olympics. And yes. I said, well... It's in the Olympics. It's never been there before. I said, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think he really knows anything about karate, but he knew that it was in the Olympics and that, uh, I, I mean, he's obviously excited too. So, I mean, it's great. It's, it's really amazing. I mean, we, um, we send out press releases and try and, you know, get the, the local media's uh, attention and maybe one in 20 press releases gets us a little bit of buzz. Yeah. But every 
major media uh, outlet re- uh, locally, they all were here and talking to us, and that I think that really helped. Yeah. Um, and maybe just move the perception of, of uh, you know of what karate is. Like some people have said it when I was working in um, recreation and fitness. You know, have your kid in a team sport. Yes. Have your kid uh, uh, in swimming. Right. And have your kid in a martial art. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's really, you know, really coming true. Um, and funny things like I remember swimming in the lake in the summertime, way out in the middle of the lake, uh, way out in the middle of the lake, you know, maybe farther than I should have been out. <laughs> but I was with somebody with one of the other guys from the club. And this lady was floating by with her husband uh, and they were on like a, a big, long mattresses. Yes, and they're, yes. my hair was matted and you can barely see my face. And she's like. And we say, hey, how's it going? And they're like, so are you still teaching at the karate club? <laughs> <laughs> they like, recognize me in the middle of the lake. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, it, so that was, that's been great, you know. Um, and uh, well, tell me about what's going on in your week before I throw the other one that I've been doing. So, My week, I've had a, obviously a really busy week going back to school. So teaching, uh, actually just this week, started teaching again at the, in the physiology lab there at UVic. So I mean... Not so crazy for me because because I don't have classes or anything. I, I'm more so just teaching and doing my master's thesis um, with this karate fitness testing stuff. But just feeling that energy when you're there. Actually, for the first couple, about three days that it started, I, was, I did not go anywhere near the school because I didn't have to. So I just said, no, I'm staying away from that madness. Because, I mean, I mean, UVic's not a very large school mm-hmm. compared to other schools. But, um, I mean, that that kind of first week craziness is still there so that was definitely uh something that i stayed away from but i did start the teaching again and that was that was great uh you know again just kind of getting orientated with that um yeah took off before that went up to christina lake beautiful christina lake for for anybody who's up there for my cousin's wedding and that was great um but yeah i mean just back to school and more stuff with this fitness testing stuff and met with my supervisors and all kinds of new stuff coming at me from there i mean it's almost, almost, almost overwhelming, but at the same time, it's great because I know it's going to be done right. So, so that's good uh, in terms of that project. So, yeah, I mean, really exciting stuff and, and another busy week, and and here we are again. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, let's get you talking about that fitness, uh, the karate fitness testing yeah. as we get into this episode. It's and great. obviously keeping us updated because we're going to go into actual testing of well, right now hundreds of athletes. Yeah, two weeks. Yeah, two weeks we start the actual fitness testing of the uh, BC team and what, 158 athletes already registered. and Record. It's crazy, just crazy. And, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we just got into the Olympics and all of a sudden we have the highest number of registrations in the province that we've ever had. Yeah, so. no, exactly. Um, and we made the system a little easier this year for people to participate. Yes, yeah. Um, lowered some barriers and we're seeing some results. And the more interest in the team, that's great. Yeah. Um, so just before we dive into a, a couple of things, I, I do have a shout out for, uh, we've, we've got a friend of ours in Japan we want to shout out to. Yes. Um, but before we get to, to him, I, I just thought of one now. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my friend in Montreal. Okay. Alexander Frankie. He is a film uh, director and uh, he and I have been chatting this week. Uh, Alex and I went to film school way back in the 90s when I was... Uh, trying to be an athlete needed something to do, do in my day. Uh, yeah. And so we met in film school and uh, he went on to actually follow through with a career. He won uh, the Best New Director Award at the Toronto Film Festival in 2009. Um, and uh, he used to train karate with me, he did judo in uh, Montreal. Um, so I'd send him a copy of uh, my book, Sunny Leads Volume 1, uh, when Sunny first goes to Japan. Right, yeah. And everybody... Pick up a copy of Sunny Leeds Volume 1. Absolutely. Yeah. We've got signed copies here in the office. Um, and uh, he read it, loved it. This is just when it came out a year and a half ago or two years ago um, and said, let me think about this. And then this week we started chatting and he said, okay, this project, he, the film he's just going into work on for this year is is uh, already on schedule. And maybe, and hey, Alex, I know you listen. <laughs> uh we're serious about uh, making the, his next film the film about the book. That's great. It's incredible. So awesome. Um, so lining up uh, the seed money, getting the talent. You see Lost in Translation? Yes. Yep. Don't so worry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Amazing film. Um, we're thinking about something 
because of the Sunny Elites is kind of a lost in translation for karate going to Japan. Sure. Where you're you have some talent, but you're you're a fish out of water. Yes. Yeah. And you're trying to figure out how to use that talent, and get better, um, and uh, understand the world around you and become more of a human uh, human being and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so yeah, so March 2018, maybe that'll be four to six weeks. We'll be in Japan shooting the film. Great. Uh, with the Japanese side and you know Canadian. Japanese joint production, I think his agents with New Line Cinema or something like that. So okay, you know, yeah. we're, it, it, I know they get thousands of scripts a month and they finally work on something. But when you got a director, it's great. So yeah, and then we're hopefully you know getting into some festivals, maybe the Toronto Festival for 2018. That's great. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this coming March, I'm going to be in Japan, meeting with Kamo Bash Sensei, who's the illustrator, and he, uh, and we'll be going over Volume Two and Three, so it comes out next year. That's a super exciting. Super so exciting. yeah, a film. That, that's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. You know, the these things uh, take time and have to gestate. And do you think Bradley Cooper's available? Hey, he make a good Sunny Leeds. Yeah, anyway. yeah, kinda exactly, kinda kinda exactly. Look. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's the neat thing is we have to find someone uh, they're in the right talent, the yes. right person. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Sunny Leeds is not me. Uh, and uh, yeah, I had some people read the book this week and they were talking to me about it because they didn't realize it was that was written for adults and there's a bit of a thriller to it. Yes, and, yeah. Um, and they said, you know, is this you? It's like, not me. Did this happen? All these things happened, but they happened to so many different people. Yeah, yeah. You'd be amazed. There's a collection of stories, really. Exactly, almost, exactly. And, and, and events, yeah. So, hey, Alex, shout out to you first. Uh, we're on this project. I know it's 100%. And uh, uh, I already announced it. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> 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 it's Clean off the lens. Here Clean we go. Lens. All right. So the next one, and Kaylin knows this guy, Takamasa Arakawa Sensei. Arakawa. How are you doing, Arakawa Sensei Ogenki? And uh, how's it going over there in Tokyo? Tokyo, 16 hours ahead of us. Yes. Yeah. All right. So Arakawa Sensei's been here twice. My best friend in Japan. Um, and so this is a challenge to Arakawa Sensei because he loves to learn English. And let's see if he's following the podcast. <laughs> yes. And Arakawa Sensei, please send us a message after you listen to this. Because I know you're fantastic with social media. Yep, we want to hear from you. Yeah. So, Sensei, honto ni yoroshiku onegaishimasu. And Minna-san, ano ne, yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Do you know what yoroshiku onegaishimasu means? Uh, nope, sure don't. Uh, it's what we say at the beginning of a class, either in a karate class or a kendo class, or if you're in elementary school, you bow at the beginning. And onegaishimasu is, there's no perfect translation, but it means, like, please be nice to me. Right, that's what I understood. It was some yeah. kind of form of respect, like, we're going to do this together. Exactly. And, and we're in this and we're going to train. Yeah. Also, you know, if you're going to Starbucks and I can't go, but I really want to get a coffee, I can give you some money and go, <laughs> <laughs> yes. get me a small latte. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yep. So, Arakawa Sensei, we look forward to hearing from you. And uh, um, come back. Come back. Come back. We, we had such a fantastic time. And bring your, bring your athletes and send us a message and tell us something you want us to give a shout out on. Yeah. And everybody else, yeah, Kiai Oats. This is when we give a shout out. Um, people will just be hearing episode one and two from episode three. Uh, we'll actually be getting feedback and we'll, we'll plug some stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, just so everybody's aware as well, we are going to be uploading these to YouTube as well. So we do have a YouTube channel. Eventually, very shortly, you'll be able to see our smiling faces That's right. as we do these podcasts. But uh, first, we're just going to put up the audio. So we will still be on YouTube. You will be able to find us at the Karate360 YouTube page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so you can listen to us there or, or anywhere else that you can find your podcast. That's right. That's right. We're going to be as accessible as we can. Uh, digital narcissism is our thing uh, yes <laughs> that's right that's right and and i think like we mentioned in, in the in the first in the first episode here this is like a two-way street we want you guys to not only be listening to this but be a part of this as well send us in some questions send us in whatever you guys have um i mean it's it's great that we can have this platform and that we can at least sit here and speak our minds but we also want to hear from you guys what you guys need want to hear what you guys have to say uh anything out there just uh find us and, and write to us that's right and you people who are fantastic with music um uh hopefully in the future someone would like to make like a five second music intro for each of our segments yeah. so key iotes we can do get something or figure something out yeah that's awesome um well we have a whole bunch of stuff to because we've done the origin episode yes so we thought we'd start using uh the segments diving into them as we go forward 
So anybody who hasn't heard the last episode, go jump on it. But we are going to try and have regular segments every time we record so that we are following things that are happening and picking up interesting stuff. Yeah. This is the, the fun conversations you have after karate class with people, but a little extra because yeah. we're going to do some digging. Yes. And get some info in. Absolutely. Yeah. So with that, the, the first kind of uh, segment we're going to go to. So breaking news, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the karate world, some recent stuff. And uh, today we really want to talk to you guys about a, a big tournament that uh, that happened, the PKF uh, Junior Cadet Championships that just wrapped up, uh, I guess, about a couple weeks ago now. Yeah, and I think this is great. I think some people will want to hear about this that haven't looked at the results. Um Obviously, we're speaking in English here, so and we're, we're we're in North America, so most likely we have more people that have friends and stuff like that that are their their own athletes, or they yes, themselves yes. were competing in the tournament, and uh, yeah, in the future we're going to talk to people, so we can actually hear from them about the results and what they did, and. Um, so, but I'll pass over to Keely. He's gonna he's gonna talk to us a little bit about the tournament. Sure. So, just for people that don't uh, know, PKF is the Pan American Karate Federation. Uh, every year they have the Junior and Cadet Championships, which, if I'm not so mistaken, is 16 years and under. Yes, I'm getting the nod of approval. Uh, I think it might even go up to 18, but we should double check that. Yes, we probably should. We should become experts in this knowledge. Absolutely, we should. <laughs> um, yeah. So the PKF Championship, like I said, wrapped up a couple of weeks ago, and. Obviously, uh, a really big tournament for all the junior and cadet athletes. And uh, what, what basically we wanted to do today was look at the... We're not going to really highlight any athletes in specific or any countries in specific. We're just going to talk a little bit about the overall medal count, how everybody did, and then we're going to compare it to last year and see how things go. So with that in mind, the results from this year's 2016 PKF Championships, the overall medal count... Um, is the the first one was the United States. So the United States had the most gold medals, but not the most total medals. The most total medals was a tie between Brazil and Venezuela. And what I find interesting between uh, this year and last year's ones is the top three for uh, medal counts for this year was the United States, Brazil, and Venezuela, whereas last year it was the United States, Venezuela, and Mexico. But this year... So Mexico was third in the overall countings this year, and last year, pardon me, and this year they dropped all the way to ninth. So last year, 2015, the PKF Championships, Mexico got a total of 27 medals, and uh, this year they they got uh, oh actually they got 23 total, but they only got two gold medals. So it's interesting. It, yeah. It, yeah. So uh, that's kind of interesting there. They might have had some strong athletes that aged out because what we're looking at here is youth, which are 12 to 13, yes. cadets, which are 14 to 15. And juniors, which are 16 to 17. Right. Okay. There we go. Uh, and for our Canadian listeners, Canada is going up a little bit. So this year, Canada was seventh uh, with 15 total medals, 11 bronze medals, one silver medal, and three gold medals for Team Canada. Uh, 15 overall. That's uh, quite a good showing for Canada. Seventh overall, opposed to, I think it was 12th. Uh, yeah, 12th last, 11th, pardon me, last year at the PKF Championship. So. Canada going up, and, and, and for whatever reason, Mexico dropped down a little bit. But yeah, I mean, big tournament, um, obviously, for juniors and cadets, it's, it's huge, and, and for the youth athletes. How do our U.S. friends do? U.S. friends were, were first. They were first this year in, in the total medal count and in the most gold medals. They had 10 golds, uh, 5 silvers, and 14 bronze, 29 over medal, overall medals. Um, so I guess... Similar to the way the Olympics do it, the PKF does it in a point system, so you get X amount of points for gold, silver, mm. and bronze, and that kind of thing. So they didn't get the most overall medals, but they did get the most gold medals. Um, so they they are ranked first in terms of the medal count for that. Pretty interesting stuff. Pretty awesome. Uh, this is a once once a year tournament, and uh, yeah, I mean it's it's pretty cool. Oh, it's great. Uh, I know that the um, this tournament is normally held in the southern hemisphere because it's so that more of the countries uh, can attend it. Whereas when you hold it in the the northern hemisphere, it can be more expensive. Yes, yes, right. So it's normally held held in that area, um, and obviously Venezuela is going through some really big troubles right now in their economy yes. and that sort of thing. And so uh, with that team traveling around or the tournament, which you know has been before, well organized because karate is quite popular there. Um, so that's great. Um, and we'll see, you know, though it w what's also interesting, especially this age group that is probably like 16, 17, or maybe even 14, 15. I mean, really, some of these people will be going off to future world tournaments. And, you know, they may be on the Olympic 2020 path. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right? 
Um, so, uh, you know, when we, when we get into some of the next tournaments and the next podcast, we'll pull out some personalities and start talking about them. I think it's harder to talk about personalities at this, this level because they're changing ages and yes. they're aging in and out. Yes. But obviously, uh, you know, that could be uh, some of the core at, at the top of who may make the Olympics. We'll talk about the Olympics in a second. That's a hard nut to crack. But. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what I find especially interesting is is these young athletes are so, so dedicated to, to karate. I mean, we're talking what, 13, 12, 12, 13, all the way up to 17-year-olds there. I mean, just so dedicated to the sport of karate. And, and, and I mean, you hear a lot now about early specialization and sometimes in sports. And it's not to say that these, these ones have, have even specialized necessarily, but just to be at that level at such a young age, it's just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I remember meeting one athlete, this is ages ago, who was training for the PKF junior championships. And, uh, they had, they, their coach kept telling them that they had a poor hikite, retracting hand. Yes. So they were, using a hand weight and doing uh, the exercise where you, um, I, I don't know why they're doing this, but they were rolling their palm up and turning their arm out to feel the tension in the outside of their arm and pulling it back. Yes. And they said they were doing it like hundreds of times a day so that their hikite and one kata move would improve because they felt like that was the part that the officials were catching. Yes, yes. And uh, hiring a strength coach to help them. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting. On that note, also what I wanted to, to, to just speak a little bit about the young athletes and that kind of stuff. You remember, obviously, in the Olympics that just happened a couple of weeks ago, um, the the kind of fl the flag bearer at the closing ceremonies for, for Canada was Penny Alexiak, the, gold, the uh, swimmer who won three gold medals and yeah. one silver medal. And there was a story that I saw in the, I think it was the Times columnist here in Victoria that came out that uh, she went back to school a couple of weeks ago. And it's like, how I couldn't imagine going back to school. I think she's going into grade 11 and she's a four time Olympic medalist. Wow. <laughs> oh, just, that's right. It's just that's absolutely right. crazy. Like walking into grade 11 and saying, well, show and tell. Here's my three golds and one silver medal. And oh, and also I carried the flag for Canada. And everyone else was like, well, I went, you know, to my grandpa's for them. Yeah, yeah. For I was looking burgers at McDonald's. Yeah, 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 it's just absolutely crazy crazy so um yeah so i mean with that we we can kind of transition right into talking a little bit more about the olympics um one of the segments that we want to bring you guys is the five rings so a lot of olympic top talk of course karate getting into the olympics huge huge announcement a few weeks ago uh actually i guess almost a month ago now that 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 came out um so what we kind of want to talk about you guys is just dig into that a little bit more about you know, just give you some main points and talk about kind of what it's going to look like and where it's going to be. And I know you yes. have some things to say about that. Where exactly is the uh, the venue that it's going to take place? The venue is, uh, there's a picture of it on the cover of my book. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's called the Nippon Budokan. So Nippon is another way of saying Japan. Okay. Nihon, Nippon. It's the same uh, characters. And Budo is the way of martial arts. Mm. Kan means building. Um, and it's the main martial arts hall in Japan. It's right beside the Emperor's Palace. Wow. Built in 1964 for the 64 Olympics. It was gonna. It was used for the judo competition. It's a eight-sided arena. Uh, no pillars in the middle. Uh, you can put 12 karate rings in. 16 wow. squashed. Wow. Yep. Um, it is a really neat facility. Uh, when they were building it, they ran out of money. They, the in Imperial family, which owns the most amount of land in Japan, uh, donated the land right beside them. It's actually part of the exterior wall of the palace um, in um, the Kudansta area just north. And so the, the Imperial family actually put money into getting it built. If you're in Japan in any martial art, you one day want to compete at the Budokan. Mm. And there's even a, a song that was written in like the 70s or 80s, and you can sing it at the karaoke bars. Oh, yes, I you remember know, you telling me that. And I can't remember. I've heard so many people uh, sing it, but I can't <laughs> remember what it is. And um, uh, yeah, and it's okay. So the Budokan's where it's going to be. And a couple of years ago, the, the president of the Budokan, because it's a nonprofit society, um, he uh, made an announcement in the media that the first week of the Olympics for 2020, the Budokan would be re only reserved for judo. Right. Right. Uh, wrestling, they wouldn't take it, wouldn't take taekwondo. That's just going to be judo. Mm. And then the second week would be for karate. This is before karate even was shortlisted. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You already know? in the schedule. And already in the schedule. Like, and he yet. just wrote it in. Like, we have it. And so um, that 
was a really uh, important p- piece of the puzzle, I think, for Tokyo picking you know karate as well. Yes, um, especially when you look at the uh, the main Olympic arena, the national arena uh, has had such a disaster of um, knocking it down planning to build this really futuristic bicycle helmet looking sort of thing mm-hmm. uh, that was going to be way too expensive. So they tossed that idea out um, and they were going to have a really compact Olympics. I think it was going to try and be within a, a very small diameter, like eight or 16 kilometers, right, but they realized right. they couldn't do it. But so with karate though, the building's there. Yes. It's yeah. there for judo. It's mm-hmm. there for karate. So the Budokan is on the inside. Of course, uh, the Budokan's famous for something else. And uh, that's being a live rock and roll venue. If you bring up Cheap Trick again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I saw the 30th anniversary. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, though, when you when people, when I point that out in the cover of my book, I go, that's the Budokan. They go, like, from the Beatles time? <laughs> like, cheap Trick time? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's actually, it's great. There's not a bad seat in the house. And the 2008 uh, World Karate Federation World Championships was held there. And so uh, I got to work as a translator between the WKF and the JKF, um, the Japan Karate Federation. And uh, um, they set up four rings uh, just right down the middle, and they put seating and everything on either side of it. So it was a little tight, but with the Olympics, it's not 400 athletes. Yeah. It's 80. Yes. 10 kata women, 10 kata men, uh, 30 kumite men, 30 kumite women. Yes, three dip weight divisions. Three weight divisions. For males, three weight divisions for, for females. That right, that's right. So they have to decide that. So that's going to fit very easily. Yeah. And I think it might only be a two-day competition at the end of it. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, so the Budokan is there. The Budokan has, a, has two sub um, martial art dojos. Actually, it has three. It has three. So one is like for judo. It's got tatami mats. One is for kendo, and then they've got a kind of sub sub one as well in the back. And um, actually, uh, Dr. Hideo Takagi Sensei, uh, who's the chair of the Wadokai Karate Technical Committee, he is the lead karate instructor for the Budokan. The Budokan has what's called the Gakuin, which is like a, an institute. Okay. Yeah. And so they have all the different martial arts that are you can train there and they have training places around japan and there are other budokans like most cities have a budokan Mm -hmm. you know uh when i lived uh in uh japan i just lived just slightly north of tokyo in in omiya city and there was an omiya budokan okay just gorgeous building you know you think how can we transplant that to (laughs) to north america be awesome um so he teaches there as well um and uh so they have their own karate program that you can join and you can be right beside the, the venue. So uh, anybody who's thinking about going, you should go. You should plan for it yes. because the venue is going to be great. Every seat in the in the whole facility is awesome. And you're right beside the Emperor's Palace and it's right central in Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo is kind of like a circle. So you can stay in all these city center areas around the circle. Right, right. Um, uh, and then it's more towards the, the 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 palace takes up the center, you know. At one time, the palace grounds in the in the late '80s when the Japanese real estate was super high, the palace was the price of um, California. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, you, you could sell the palace, you could buy all of California. Jesus. A little bit different yeah. now, I would say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It went up and down. There was a time when there's a uh, an area just not far from it called Ginza, which was uh, also the price of of um of california as well in terms of buying land so yeah it's going to be quite an interesting place to compete uh i don't know where the athletes are saying there's an athlete village that they have to build right um but it'll be on reclaimed land so because tokyo has a big bay right right. and they've been building uh, over the last decade uh, several decades they've been building out into the ocean so um yeah very exciting um so we know where it'll be it'll be at the budokan itself that's right we know what it will look like in terms of the number of athletes. One thing that I'm kind of wondering though, is in terms of the weight classes for Kumite specifically, is there's gonna have to be some kind of, it's gonna have to match up with the qualifying tournaments. So, I mean, right now, obviously there's more than just three weight classes for Kumite. And what I'm wondering is if that's gonna change, if if it's gonna change that there's gonna be just three right across the board and, and how they're gonna do that. Cause I mean, obviously, um, and the, quali- the qualifiers are going to have to be the same weight class as w- what it's going to be or what it's going to look like in the Olympics. So 
it's going to be interesting to see how, how they do that and how they kind of uh, put together the whole qualifying route to get to the Olympics. So the only rumor that I've heard is, and who knows, because they haven't announced it yet, yeah. is uh, the Continental Tournaments in 2019 will have three weight classes. Okay. And those will be the qualifiers. Okay. And um, so I, I don't know if it's if it's 70 kilograms and over. Sure. If you weigh 70 kilograms and over... But if you're in the middle, you know, do they make a cutoff where there's already a weight division right now? So yeah. it's minus 75. It's that's the cutoff. If you're 75 and over, you get to go and they don't. So there's there's no new weight class that covers two current weight classes. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see to see kind of which way they go on that and how it's going to affect the rest of karate um, and all the other tournaments, because I would imagine that most people are going to want to mimic the same ones that the that the olympics are going to use yes exactly so they haven't announced it Th- along with that they haven't announced this um the wkf had made uh an, an a send out a press release that every karate person in the world who wants to compete in the olympics will have a shot mm. but they didn't say how that was going to be right because right now you have to be in and uh you have to be a member in a national sport federation for your country for yes. karate yes that's a member of the World Karate Federation, WKF. Yes. And there are other World Karate Federations, but they're not official in terms of the IOC, only WKF. Um, and some people worried that there would be another qualifying series completely detached from all the NSOs. Mm. But that wouldn't make sense because all these NSOs are the ones that support the WKF. Yes. And then I know recently the WKF uh, sent out a message saying that, you know, if you're an official, you have to, you're can only if you're an of a WKF official, right, licensed official, you've gone to WKF tournaments be- and passed that point. But you're not supposed to go and officiate in other tournaments mm. that are non WKF. Right. So that would mean that there's no, no crossover there's, there. Yeah. 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 So be interesting. You know, the other thing about the Olympics is will the rules change? Yes. Of course. Yeah. And um, that's kind of always a question, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, I know after the senior. Uh, PKF tournament um, people were talking about you know, would there be a rule change and I remember talking to friends in Japan um, that uh, with kata right now the referees raise their flags but there's no metric given back to the athletes sure. who was better and why they were better sure so now I would uh, I would love to see a way that a metric would you know some sort of result would come back to say okay why were you better yes that's what I remember when I was competing in Kata coming up they used to use the point system you know where you, you they would each the, have the scorecard you know you would get six yep. point oh or or six point two or whatever it was and at least in that way you knew you didn't necessarily know why you lost but you knew kind of how much you lost by sure, in this sure. case you just kind of know well, you lost three flags to two, and, and it doesn't really give you much feedback, I think. So, yeah, it is kind of interesting. Um, I also think it's it's a little bit easier for the spectators to be able to count, okay, there's three flags against two, obviously, Echo wins. Um, so I, so I, I can see the benefit there, too. Yeah. Now, of course, this is our podcast, our opinions. Yes. Um, obviously, we teach kata, we promote kata. We, it's part of who we are as a club and what we like about karate community and stuff. When it comes to uh, to kata competition, though, I'm always interested to see if something better can be done with it. Mm. Because you do one kata, which is really long, like Sparempe, and it's like a 800,000 meter race, basically. Yes, yes. Right? You do another kata that's maybe an unsu, and that's like a 200 meter race. Yes. I mean, in terms of the length of the kata moves that you're doing, you know, two different obstacle courses that can be quite different um, and can give you a really different result. Um, what, what I found in Japan, and there is definitely more depth in in uh, refereeing, just because there's so many more courses, um, you can really get a, uh, a good feeling for the temperature of uh, of kata. And they do a lot of the first rounds. They do still with scorecards, six point yes. five to seven point five, yes. seven point zero being the the middle. And I remember after like ten years of being there and doing it, I really got good at being able to pick a seven point zero kata. Sure, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And obviously, when you're using scorecards, you're putting somebody up somebody down so the score is not actually their score it's how you're putting them in a series like yes you can't give everybody 7.1 and then when you're not gonna have any results yes you have to put everybody at different levels um but we create in the future and again this is just me <laughs> right uh, where 
and this is pretty wild concept, but the referee, you walk up and the referee just lifts the card and go, okay, everyone's doing, these two people have to do Chetanyara Kushenku. Mm. And you're oh, okay, I've got to do Chetanyara Kushenku yes, to pass yes. this round. You go to the next round and it's, you know, something different. And um, that might have to be style specific or they just say, okay, here's, here's 25 uh, katas from a bunch of different styles and as a good kata athlete you have to have all 25 down or 15 right, right. now that might sound radical to some people in karate but in Iaido Japanese sword training there's a seite katas now they're short right like sure. four or five moves sure but they come from four or five different I think it took them in sets of two and I think there's 12 of them last time I practiced there's 12 and they come from let's say you know five or six different sword styles so right. when you're performing and everybody in the main line well, let's say one of the major mainline ways of doing yaido would learn the seite katas and and grade in them before they did their style kata right and that's how they merged or got the the, the yaido groups to work together a bit not saying it's perfect but you had to go up there and do it yeah. well i mean it's not so much different than i mean even just a few years ago i think they got rid of the shite katas which was uh, i'm not, i'm not sure but i think it was just something that, that we were maybe using in here in bc but um where no was shite katas worldwide okay and in, in japan they even had a daini shite kata which was a second shite katas if you don't know what those are those are four there was our eight katas eight, yeah. two from the four main styles yes. and there was a second set of two from the four main styles and they used both in Japan. Yes. And she took out there was an idea that it was more of a baseline to get through the first or second round. Yes. And that's why I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if, if we, if just us in BC, if we adopted that for our competition stream or if, if everybody used it. But, um, yeah, I mean, you had eight katas and you had to know at least, some of them cause you had to do a shite kata. So it's yeah. not that much different as asking somebody, you know, here's a list of katas. You're going to do one of these. We're going to tell you what it is and away you go. Um, just thinking about kata in in the Olympics, I kind of likened it a little bit to figure skating because mm -hmm. in figure skating it's very it's very similar where you go out and you do kind of a performance, um, and you're you know you're you're uh, judged on your ability to do it and how well you do it, and how smooth you go through the moves and that kind of thing, which is quite similar to kata, but obviously in figure skating they do it where you get a point system where mm -hmm. you and, and they rank you from first being whatever and, and last so. Yeah, I'm not sure how they're going to do it, but I, but I, I agree that I think uh, I think there's a better way to do it than just the the red and blue flags. Absolutely. Um, let's. I'd love to hear what other people think about this. Yeah. Uh, Arakawa Sensei. Hello, Arakawa Sensei. Hello, Arakawa Sensei. <laughs> um, one year, what he did, and this was really neat actually, is um, he had, uh, and he might have taken this from like ballroom dancing or something, um, where he had people, the athletes. Um, like for four or five minutes, they would do their kata over and over and there'd be like six or eight of them. It was like a big ring. Okay. Six or eight of them were doing kata and then we, the judges, walked around and we ranked the kids in order of who we thought was worst, a top, you know, best to least. Sure. And then the four or five at the end of the round, they stopped them and then we gave our score to the table and then they just added all the scores together and then whoever, whichever mm. kid, you know, had the most number of, the highest number would be at the top. Right, right. Averaged it out. And and that was quite interesting because it gave the kids the time to, to do the kata over and over and over again. We could look at them. Uh, I thought it would be really, really chaotic. But actually, what what ended up happening is the if, if you had six, the bottom three were easily identifiable. Yes. Zoom, they're out. Sure, yeah. You know? And then the top three, you could really start studying them a little bit more. Right. Um, uh, but at a higher level. So it will be interesting what the what they come up with by the Olympics and how they can get there. Um, one of the kids in Arakawa Sensei's club who's in uh, university, he uh, ha he put this on Facebook. He's been playing with sensors and gloves. Mm, okay. And his thing he said in Japanese was um, sometimes you, know, as an athlete, you know you've landed on target, but the referees didn't see it. And so um, this way that, and I think some of the Taekwondo, but it, there was still a requirement in, in how he was doing his uh, university project was you you got the score right but you still had to show the technique sure sure um instead of a different way of doing it where you just tag yes um so he had put the sensors in the gloves and he was had some video of showing um how someone was blocking it but the glove was still scoring yes um which i know is some of the i don't know the fault but but some of the backlash that taekwondo gets a little bit in the olympics because they do the the sensor 
um, system, or at least they did. No, they still do the sensor system. Yes, and if you yeah. watch, there's a video that's going around recently on Facebook, which shows old Taekwondo, like even 10 years ago. Yes. Or it's very aggressive and very strong and techniques hitting. And it shows recent Taekwondo and there's like two guys kind of hopping on one foot and yes. you can tag the other guy. Yes. Um, and, you know, whatever they have to go through to make their art better, that's great. Sure. If, if they're going through something different. Um, yes, yeah, so the Olympics will be interesting. I remember um, back in 1999 talking to Seiji Nishimura Sensei. And Nishimura Sensei, and a lot of people know because he's been to the United States and Canada and Europe. He's a really good uh, seminar coach. Um, he was no fun to train with and spar <laughs> back in the 90s. He, he just loved hitting people really hard. Um, he was he would train the Tokyo team when I was there in the early 90s and it was just no fun. But as a seminar coach, he's awesome. Right. Nishimura Sensei, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> That's right, right. He has really fun drills and people really enjoy his seminars. Just um, don't spar with him. Just don't <laughs> spar with him. Um, and uh, he was saying back then that there was talk about using nanotechnology in the gi fiber. Mm. And they said if, it, if karate would ever go to the Olympics, maybe they could have it in the fiber of the uniform. Um, and maybe the, you know, at that time, they don't have the the micro technology maybe they do now, but that was similar to fencing where you know if someone had tagged or not. So yes. yeah. So that you know, they're always talking about it. But the the problem is will you lose the quality of of the technique just over the speed? Mm. Um and then again there's a lot of play, right? Uh I remember uh a famous athlete here in Canada named Lisa Ling and uh she'd done really well in Canada and, and internationally. Um and she had, had said this thing in this documentary that we shot was, um, you know, sometimes it goes your way and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you get scored on when you, the referee gives the other athlete uh, a point and you know it didn't land. Yes. But you know that sometimes you've scored. Yes, exactly. When you shouldn't, when yes. you got a point when you shouldn't have. And so it evens out. It all like, evens out, yeah. You know, the key is to try and keep going forward. And, you know, even in, you know, the, in soccer they have, you know, controversies about goals and stuff like sure, that. Sure. So, um, you know, the key, I think, really is in, uh, making sure the, the officials' eyeballs get better and better. Yes. And obviously with the Olympics, that'll be interesting. Yes. And now, of course, we have the Coaches Challenge, too, which is, uh, I think, a great, a great aspect that's been added um, to Kumite, specifically, is, is the Coaches Challenge. It just gives that extra opportunity that, oh, maybe maybe something was missed here or, or maybe you didn't see this type thing, which most uh, major sports at least have adopted and I think it's great that karate's brought that on. It'll be really interesting that for the Olympics because uh, the coach's challenge what we're talking about is in Kumite if the coach thinks that the, their athlete actually really got a point they do a um, video replay Yes, yes. and then a bunch of uh, uh, officials are dedicated to looking at the monitor and they use it for the, the recent Canadian Nationals I think they've used it in some of the big international events um, and it's tricky, you know, that's something we'll talk about another time sure. in terms of how to use it. Mm. In Japan, it'll be really interesting because uh, in the Budokan, they have, they can put up these massive uh, flat screens on, ah, the, yes. on either side of the stadium. <laughs> so everybody can see. Everybody can see yes. it. And I remember one year, it was, um, uh, what was his name? He, it's not uh, Matsuhisa, but another, Araga. Araga one year, it was like 2012. 2011, 2012, he's the main Japan national championships is the first or second weekend of, of uh, December. And so he, he was sparring with somebody in like a semifinals and they clashed and collided in the Budokan. Mm. Clash climb came apart and then Araga started bleeding and no, or the other, no, the other athletes started bleeding and they couldn't figure out why he was bleeding because it didn't look like the punch was that hard. Mm. But as they hit the other, the, the, both of them hit each other at the same time and they actually collided heads. Right. And I think this tooth uh, or mouth guard of Araga hit the other guy. Nice. And then on the big flat screen, you know, they did it really <laughs> slow. Of course they did. And <laughs> it was funny because the Japanese audience was like, oh, and then you could hear people like, eh, eh. And Japanese like, when you're confused, you say, eh, <laughs> nani, what's that? Eh, nani, nani. And then they showed it on this on the screen in slow mo, and then the entire like eighteen thousand people went, "Ah, oh, <laughs> soka, ah, soka means I get it." Oh, soka, <laughs> and uh, so then eh? so that that must be it. So, yeah. So again, the, the Buddha Ken is gonna be a really neat place, and you can see that in all the different angles about what happens. Um, you know, judo has obviously been in there, and uh, there was a, a famous judo athlete who won uh, a gold medal back in the day in 1964 and um 
Oh, I'm going to think it, it may have been an American athlete or someone from Europe. Uh, it just slipped my mind, his name. But um, when he won, his teammates were going to run onto the, the tatami to celebrate, right? Mm. And he put his hand up and said, don't. Like, don't disrespect a, sure. the ring. Like, yeah, let's not. Because yeah. what we're doing is we're disrespecting the other athlete. Yes, of if course. We jump up and down. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, the drama will be big. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be great. Uh, so we kind of beat that five rings. We kind of got that going. Uh, what I want to talk about a little bit next is one of the other segments is kind of moving into here as we get going is the technical tactical. We're going to talk a little bit uh, throughout this, these podcasts about the technical aspects of karate and the tactical aspects of karate. And one thing that I wanted to talk to you about, because I know you know lots about this and, and you have some insights, I'm sure, on this, is the the use in karate of us. Ah, us. 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 Yes, because I know some people, uh, most karate people are familiar with us, and um, I think most use it in their clubs, but I also know that some clubs don't use us. So maybe you could shed a little bit of light on that. Yeah, and we had a we had a really nice uh, teenager come and try out the class the other day, and, and he was like, I, was, I said to everybody, okay, we're doing stuff. Hi, sensei. And then he was like, oh, I'm, I keep wanting to say us, but am I not allowed to? Mm-hmm. Well, you can say us if you want to. <laughs> um, yeah, and... Uh, you know, um, Karate by Jesse, he's talked about this a little bit on his blog yeah, and his video. Yeah. And I remember um, way back, there was email or once or twice between him and me when we were in Japan. Because this came up, um, and I grew up yelling Oso like everybody else. There's a couple of theories on Os, but normally the main thing is they don't want people to say it because there might be the idea that might have some connotations to militarization in the second world war mm, okay and how also was said in you know really proper japanese you know um uh koryu uh, martial arts like the original mainline martial arts um they don't say also because uh they don't want to be tainted with that you know sure um but also y- here's a really interesting thing about us it sounds really close to onigashimasu. Mm, yes, yeah, yeah. And even baseball in Japan, they'll say os. Is it the same os that came out of pre-World War II Japan uh, when Japan was a uh, uh, totalitarian society, totalitarian society yes, yes. or whatever? Or uh, or is this os the end of onigashimasu? Mm. Especially in, West, in Eastern Japan, they sometimes drag out the S sound, right? I was in us. Oh yes, yes guys sure. can. Hey, yes, you know, yes. you know, was, you know? Mm-hmm. and you go into, and so I would go into the office at work, and where I worked uh, as a full time karate instructor in Tokyo was in a private high school. It had the oldest karate club in Tokyo for high school, and and it was really strong with sports. And so a lot of the teachers were related. Their their, their background was heavy in sports, professional sports. Right? Sure, sure. And you go in the office instead of like, oh, hi, was I mas? Oh, hi, was I mas? Oh, hi, was I mas? Oh, it's like, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's like, os, hey, os, os, mm. hey, os. Mm. Is it the same os that they use in the karate dojo? Might be a little bit different. Sure, yeah. Um. Uh, but some people really scream it out, and uh, and some people like it. And I get it. Os can be like the answer for yes. It can yeah. be the answer for I hear you. It can yeah. be the answer for like I'm going to try and do something. It, it it is a bonding little has a little bonding thing to it but the moment i got to japan the very first time i said os and i was in a wado dojo they were like don't say it. it's height oh really height is is a polite refined way of saying it mm. it might also go back to when karate was considered the bad boy sport you know all the bad boys went out and did karate sure okay. and i don't know if that relates to like you know back in the, the, the origins of soccer and rugby when you know uh, the more polite people would play soccer and yeah. the, the, the people who came from a rougher background would play rugby. Sure. And that's kind of changed now. Um, but karate definitely has some of that. You know, when you read the autobiography of uh, Hirokazu Kanazawa, who's a very famous Shotokan man, who we have we have it, that book here. Yes. He yeah. talks about karate being the bad boy art. Mm-hmm. And so also maybe be tainted with that. Um but uh, when was the first time you heard that people didn't say us? I think actually the first time that I didn't hear it would have probably been uh, just probably about a couple of years ago, actually, that people said, and I think it was a Wado uh, athlete, uh, I can't remember who it was, um, said, just said that they don't use that in the yeah. dojo. And I was totally surprised because when I grew up uh, practicing Shidoru, 
uh, always, always. It was, us, 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 yes, I'll do that. So it was just really strange. I just thought everybody used it. And you see now also too on social media and that kind of stuff, people posting all across karate, you know, posting their, their pictures or whatever. And at the end they always put us, us. Yeah, so yeah, like, exactly. Okay, well, yeah, I guess everybody's using it. Well, you know, Shotokan did and is probably the most widely used sport and my, my practice sport. And so, uh, um, a lot of the other styles will, will I think, adopt some of that. Sure. Th- sure. And there were Shiteru groups that I knew in Japan that some people would say it. Um, but Os is like Kyokushin too. Like mm. Kyokushin Karate. Os. Bend the arms, bend the elbows, mm. lean forward, make the muscle pose. And Os, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, um, And even karate people, or just regular people in Japan would say, oh, you do karate Os, mm. right? And But they've just seen like... Uh, the Kyokushin World Championship Tournament on TV. Sure. And all the guys saying, oh, um, but yeah, it's in, in polite society, it's it's height. Yeah. It's height. Um, and a little bit cleaner. So yeah, also it's interesting. I, I actually, I love the fun play of it in, in uh, not like, I, I'm in a cult and I'm replying to you and, and, and not saying everybody who uses Osa is in a cult. Sure. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, don't get that meaning. <laughs> um, yeah, but I like the playfulness of it, like, you know, coming into work or something and saying, oh, it's like, like, yeah, we're getting it on, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. we got business to do and we're yes. going to make it happen yes, oh, it's, yeah. oh, it's, um, in sort of uh, the macho, like, I kind of liked it in the, because uh, there was a really strong baseball team in our school and baseball's like, baseball in Japan is like a martial art. Yeah. They don't call it baseball, they call it yaku, oh. right? You don't spit on the field in Japan and they go marching and you shave their head and that's middle school, <laughs> you know, it, they take it seriously. Uh, and they can sometimes say, oh, so yeah. O S S. Um, and there's kanji for it as well. Um, I'd love to hear some people's stories about when they found out <laughs> they don't say us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or like, even just what their general meaning. Cause to be honest, uh, even coming up, using us, I didn't really even know what it meant. I was just yes. saying it as a response to my sensei or, yeah. or to whoever, us, us. So yeah, just automatic subconscious reaction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And actually it's so funny. Uh, it, you know, more so when I was in elementary school, if the teacher would say something, I would catch myself up and go, us. And like, <laughs> oh no, sorry. Yes, I understand. <laughs> and they go, what? And I'm just like, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah. It's funny. Oh, well, you know, on the PC team, there'd be athletes. You'd say something, say, us, us. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, um, yeah, and changing the culture to coach, like don't call me sensei, call me coach sure. when, we're, when we're doing sports sure, karate. Sure, sure. Your, yeah. your club instructor is your sensei. Yeah. Um, and so, but whatever makes your club instructor happy, are you happy? Uh, Do it. You know, I have some really, really good friends in Shotokan and sometimes they write os at the end and I, I don't care because they're happy to talk to me. So sure. os me all you want, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And, os. Uh, os. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, Obviously, the, the JKA in Japan, Japan Karate Association, it's big, you know. That, that's called the uh, Kyokai. Okay. Yeah, yeah. association. They're, they're called the Kyokai. So, yeah. Speaking a little bit about um, karate in Japan specifically. There's karate in Japan? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I've never been, actually. But <laughs> let's go in March. Uh, let's go. <laughs> um, one thing I know that you've told me and that I found interesting and that I think that we've kind of highlighted is something that would be great to get here in North America would be um, karate in a university and actually oh, getting yeah. it in the school system. Um, I mean, you look at, and we've talked about this for sure outside of the podcast, um, about wrestling being, the rest sport of wrestling, getting a university, you know, you can, you can pretty much ride that out in university as a wrestling athlete. You can be a, you can get a scholarship in wrestling and you can just wrestle, go to school and, and that's your life. Yep. To have something like that for karate athletes, first of all, do you think that's a possibility? And second of all, do you think with this Olympic uh, announcement that it's more likely? Well, you know, with me, anything's possible. Absolutely. <laughs> <it is. laughs> I love challenges. Yes. I love things that, lots of people can get a really good benefit out of, you know? Yeah. yeah. That actually really always really is really fun for me to see like, wow, we did something. A lot of good people got something out of that. Sure. Um, with wrestling, it's, it was the NCAA. Yes. Yep. Right. NCAA. Yep. And that's in the States and lots of different sports. That's what wrestling is through in the States. So if you, and wrestling is big in secondary schools and universities. Yes. Especially in the States. Yeah. Yep. Now if you're in Canada, um, uh, you know, one of the national training centers is in, in just beside Vancouver and Burnaby yes. at Simon Fraser yeah, University. Yeah. Um, 
And so they have a, a, a it is a varsity varsity team. Yeah, program, yeah. Right? And they go they're part of the NCAA in the states. Yeah. So they go down to the states to compete. Obviously then um they're in that system. There's no reason why not something can get started, you know. Um and there is a university uh karate championships. Actually it happened the weekend after the August third announcement. Um oh, I'm trying to remember what it was. Portugal maybe? It's on the website there. But um uh Nagoto Sensei, who's a WKF Secretary General. Hello Nagoto Sensei. Mm -hmm. I remember he sent me a message that he was enjoying himself on the beach after many meetings uh, in Rio, and then he was <laughs> off from there to, I think it was Portugal, to the um, the World University Championships. Right. So what I'm saying is there is there is, there is something there. And to get something going, I actually know a guy. Hey, Kevin, down in Florida. All kinds of shout outs here. Today. I'm trying Everybody's my best, getting, man. Yeah, yeah, it's I'm <laughs> trying my best. Are we going to have any for <laughs> next month? <podcast? laughs> uh, yeah, there's 100 million people in the karate <laughs> world. I don't think we're going to sure run we'll out. find some. Um, he said that when he was going to college in the States, he got a scholarship for karate. Okay. And I don't know how he worked it. Maybe it was just something like, you know, if you, uh, individual sport or martial arts. Sure. But it wouldn't take that much. Now, the thing is, you know, does it put more layers on the athlete? Mm. Well, let's look at the Japanese model. Um, when you go to university and you get into a karate club, maybe you're going to that university to get in that karate club. Yes. That means you're in a high performance training program. Sure. Now, obviously white belts can join, but a lot of them are black belts and that's where they will train and not study. What? Go to university and not study? <laughs> yes, that's right. I said that correctly, everybody. In Japan, when you go to university, pretty much you don't study. Now, if you're in a STEM program, science, technology, English, math, you will be doing something. Sure. Uh, if you're in, you know, the social sciences, you'll be going to classes and listening to lectures. But you don't really study until you graduate and get into a job and they teach you what you're supposed to know or sure. you go off to graduate school and then you have to study. Uh, so you spend your time training. And Arakawa Sensei is the director of the Budo International University. So they have a karate training club and they train, you know, five, six days a week. And that's your life, yeah. you know? The you friends you make in university are friends for life. A 30 or 40% of people in Japan go to university. And uh, um, it's called bukatsu. Bukatsu. So if you're in the karate bu, bu means group. So I'm in, you know, you might say, I'm in the karate bu. Uh, and tennis bu, saka bu, mm. you know. Uh, and bukatsu means um, uh, your your club activities. It's a really uh, intense competition for Japan. It's so intense, okay, that there's f they use the WKF rules, Kay. right? Yeah. And they've got four referees, four corner, ref four f corner officials and a center referee. And the four corner officials have whistles. Mm -hmm. And so if a corner official sees something that the other officials miss, even though they put the flag out, they blow a whistle. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons is they, they want to stop the two athletes from bashing each other's <laughs> heads in if they're too aggressive. Yes, yes. Um, Japanese university clubs, the private universities have the strongest clubs. They have more money. They have a stronger program. And basically what you do is you're attracting stronger athletes who are already really talented at a high school level. Um, the public universities, not as strong a club. Uh, uh, normally on level, but obviously they train a lot. And then they have their spring, summer, and winter um, gashiku, training camp. Can we do that over here? Well, it's, it's hard to say if the private club, let's say like us at Kenzen, right? If we have a really great recreational program and a great high-performance program, then we want people training here as much as they can. Sure. But one of the things I like about having a college program is if if you're really really into it into your sport and you really want to excel and but you still want to go to university you can get you can get both of you know do both things yeah right yeah, i think yeah. you know wrestling is uh, it's a really good example yeah i mean as a university student I, I it would almost be like a dream come true to be able to to study and just do karate and make that your life i mean granted that's practically my life <laughs> that's now. probably what you do now but, yeah. um, <laughs> only 10 minutes from the university yeah but to to get a scholarship in it and then to kind of get a full ride through to to help with that and to just 
I don't know, I guess really dedicated would, would be unbelievable. So that's, uh, I think it's some, uh, personally, I think it's something that, that we could adopt. It's just a matter of getting there. Well, looking at, um, that's a neat thing. We're, it's just as, m- as diverse as karate is now, there's still a lot of pioneering that can be done yes. and with the Olympics that will come through. Yes, absolutely. The thing is, you know, when, can we get something going? Will it get going? Even, you know, w- another good model is like, um, in Tokyo, there's like there's these there's six universities, and they all have like uh, their famous universities, Waseda, Keio, and stuff. And they their baseball teams have their own mini famous tournament right. where they're against each other. Sure. And so, if you could get you know six universities in North America to have really int- amazing high performance programs, yeah, 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 and then figure out how to cover the cost of the travel or whatever, yeah. um, you just need you wouldn't need to have every university to have a varsity team you just need to have six yeah right yeah. just enough to create some diversity yeah um and then you'll have all other ones wanting to jump on board and exactly then you're rolling exactly great right on well let's move on let's move on to the uh, officials tip segment and i'm going to leave this one to you because i know you have one that uh you're thinking about yeah yeah we've been thinking about all kinds of officials tips you know so uh welcome to shimpanru <laughs> shimpanru yeah. named by namaki sensei there we go uh shimpan means official or ru means style and when you are as we told you in the uh we spoke about in the origin episode when you're studying to be an official that's a new world of karate for you yes yes and studying is uh is definitely the word for it I am not a WKF official. Nor am I. Nor am I. Yes, but I sure have watched a lot of them. Sure. And learned from uh, some of the best. And obviously, uh, um, there are WKF ranked officials here in uh, Canada and all over the United States yeah. and everywhere around the world. Um, but the, f- the tip I want to say is uh, from Norma Sensei. So Norma Foster here locally. Shout out to Norma Sensei. Hey, Norma Sensei, how are you doing? Um, um, she's probably listening to this while she's playing golf. I hope it's <laughs> not interrupting her swing. Living the life. Yes. Uh, um, you say yame. You're the center referee and you say yame, right? And it's the heat of the moment. And the athletes are going back to the line. And you walk back to the line and then you, you know, give out a point or a penalty or whatever. Yes. And then you put your foot back and you're about to start again. You're like, wait a minute, I should look at the board. Yes. Where is the point? And you look over your shoulder, then you, uh, I should say it into the mic, you look over your shoulder. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm gesturing already. Uh, and then you start and it slows the pace down. Yes. And it slows. And so I just remember Norman and they look at me very sternly. You can look at the board as you walk back to the official's line. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that's a great tip. Yeah. I should have thought of that. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember after that, all day long, I was doing like, I would say, yeah, man, look at the board. First, make sure the athletes are safe back on the line, you know? And then, you know, just for that like half second, it takes you to walk over, take your time, check the board. I'm like, oh yeah. And that, it was great. Cause then I was, it was helping me, you know, keep on top of what was going on. Now, yes. sometimes we give a penalty, you should check over your shoulder and stuff. Um, and, uh, and I remember at the end of the tournament thinking, I wonder how many times a day she says that <laughs> <laughs> as a match area controller, you yes, know, like yes. you can look at the board, you can look at the board. Um, and, uh, you know, I may have felt like, Oh, I got a really amazing tip here. And actually like, you know, it's 300 of us in the last like, six months at yeah. nine tournaments. Yes. have heard the same thing. So and now all of you have heard it. Now all of you have heard it <laughs> and you will use it. And, uh, um, you can call it the Foster Sensei glance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the foster sensei, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Look at the board. Look at the board. If they're looking at the board as they're walking back, they're doing the Foster Sensei glance. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was our Shimpanru tip of the week. Write into us about your tip of the week and what you want to know about, and we'll go find it out. There it is. Moving on, we want to talk a little bit about Crossover Genius. So I don't know if this is something that we completely highlighted in the first uh, episode, but we want to know a little bit about um, crossover athletes who have gone from karate to maybe other sports or gone on to do great things. And uh, yeah, so l- l- let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, segments, um, we won't hit every single segment, maybe every week, no, but no. Um, we're going to come up with new ones. Um, I've got the one of the Otsukare uh, Samadeshita, mm-hmm. which means you did a very good job. We say Otsukare Samadeshita at the end of anything you've done in Japan when you've been working. Um, and I, I think there'll be a better term for using this, but this is for people who have, uh, for karate people who have passed away. 
And there's nothing thing we're going to talk about tonight. But that, again, in terms of like segments and things we can chat about. Yeah. And again, listeners out there, what's something you think we should talk about? Yeah. Yes. Write to us. Let us know. So crossover genius. You've got one about someone who's going to have a UFC. Pr- um, yeah, just one that, uh, I mean, obviously UFC is just a hot mainstream sport right now. Um, one of my favorite athletes right now in the UFC is this guy named Steven Wonderboy Thompson. Um, fights out of California. He is a former Kenpo. Well, I suppose he is a still Kenpo black belt. Uh, trained in karate for years. He's got some videos online on YouTube of doing some karate, some old, uh, older traditional karate training. Anyways, he is finally got his title shot at the welterweight championship at UFC 205 at uh, in a monumental matchup in New York. It's the first actual UFC in Madison Square Garden. So um, karate athlete making UFC gold. And we've heard of it uh, a few times, you know, Leota Machita and GSP, of course, here in Canada and all across the world is a, a huge name. Um, yeah, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, former karate guy going for UFC gold. Do, do you know what he fought in before to get into UFC? He was a kickboxer, so he was a uh, Kempo Karate, and then from Kempo Karate he went into kickboxing, and then kickboxing he went into MMA, and he went through the Ultimate Fighter uh, reality TV oh, show okay. route, wound up in the UFC, and has just been kind of baffling everybody with his kind of karate technique more so than anything. And, and one of the things they say is is really tough to train for karate athletes in the MMA world is that it's really hard to mimic a karate athlete the way they move and the way they, they come in and bounce out and bounding all over the place. So, um, yeah, so it's exciting, exciting for him and, and for karate athletes. Yeah, I, I think when you think about, you know, when we turn, we call it crossover genius, but this is, you know, people have worked really hard yeah. to be go up. There's something we can look at in terms of the sumo world. You know, there is only one professional sumo league, and that's in Japan. Uh, there's an amateur sort of circuit for world athletes, but there's really not many serious sumo competitions sure. going on in any sort of broad basis. So if you're a big athlete and wrestling is your thing or you're attracted to sumo and you want to make money at it, you have to go to Japan. Sure. You know, that's where the big money is. And... Um, you know, of course, I've heard people saying, let's get sumo into the Olympics, but it's not going to happen because it's not a worldwide sport. Yeah. Um, and there are other Olympic sports that aren't worldwide, but they got into the Olympics years ago because it came from um, Europe. Um, and I think the thing with UFC is the same. Like if, um, and this is a good segue into the, what I want to talk about with the book that I've been reading you know, uh, by John Cavanaugh, who's the coach of uh, Kana Magadega, notorious. Yes. Also a former karate athlete. Actually. Yeah, actually, yeah. 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 John Cavanaugh was Gregor McGregor also a karate yes, athlete. Yes, yeah. So. Day, yeah. Yeah. So both of them were, and um, and in John's book that came out, or Mr. Cavanaugh's book, <laughs> Coach Cavanaugh. Yeah, Coach Cavanaugh. <laughs> there we go. Um, uh, called Win or Learn. Uh, he talks about his journey about how he was a karate athlete. Then he got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, yes, yeah. started a club in Ireland, the very first one, uh, BJJ club, uh, with 400 square feet. Now he's a 9,000 square foot club, yeah. 700 members. He's got like 50 professional athletes, but only a few of them actually make real money at it. Yes. And, um, the UFC is where it happens. Sure. So for us in the karate world, if, you know, it's great that we've got this fantastic Olympic opportunity now, but if we have people in our clubs that they really want to become a professional, we should support them if that's their dream. Absolutely, yeah. You know, um, and uh, again, so this, the book, actually, if anybody wants to pick it up, it's a great book called yes, Win or Learn. Yeah. And Coach Gavino, um, you know, he talks about the, um, uh, if you want to, if you're going to do full contact in any sport, especially combat sports, don't do it unless you're getting paid money for it. Of course. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. You take so it. much damage, yeah, right? Yeah. And he was saying they do flow training. So they'll, as they're leading up to a, a really big competition. Now he's probably the dominant coach in the UFC. If not, he's in the top five, in the top five, for sure. For yeah. sure. Right. Because he's got some major athletes and they, in the recent, what was it? The recent uh, Amateur World MMA Championships. Ireland took the most medals. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This year or last year. But he said they don't do any hard f- sparring. Yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of clubs, MMA clubs now don't. They've, they've adopted more of a drill. You just drill, 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 and very limited sparring. And so people would, yeah, because people would be doing really hard sparring. They get injured, and then 
they drop out. Yes. They have to drop out. And they, yes. He said, you know, for the last 10 years, they just expected whoever their athlete, their, the opponent for the athlete was, they would probably drop out at some point. Yes. And they just had to expect that they, anybody else in that weight division would have to come in and, and be, uh, it would happen. As with Conor McGregor, he's had to move up and down. Yeah. Right? So, um, yeah, I'm fascinated how, you know, if we talk about in this, it ties into technical, technical, because it's just a slight change of technique. Sure. But the application and how we think about it mentally is just the same. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. and if anybody wants to build a club, that's a great book, no matter what your martial art is on, on how to think about building a club and, and giving a great service to the athletes and, and where you can go with it. And, you know, the, I think the money that Coach Kavanaugh makes uh, with his fighters in the UFC isn't what builds his club. Yeah. It's the recreational members, you know? Yes, yes. And what I found interesting about one of the interviews that he did uh, recently, one of the podcasts that we were listening to, was, uh, you know, he had his his karate dojo, and, and then he kind of expanded that into a Brazilian jiu-jitsu karate martial arts dojo. And then he said he just kind of, by chance, accidentally turned into this yes. coach, <laughs> this MMA coach that was, you know, coaching the, the biggest name in MMA and, and combat sports of Conor McGregor. But he said he's still got his his traditional roots, and, and he said he doesn't envision himself um, just being an MMA coach all the time, and he's going to go back and, and eventually just go back to his dojo thing and, and just really focus on that. Yeah, that's thing I've really uh, connected with is his dedication to be in the club six, seven days a week, yes, even when he's yeah. not, there's no money from it. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, obviously everything he's doing is building his club and earning a career, but it's in the dojos where you may where you're making no and he said he'll roll with all the athletes yeah. when they're doing jujitsu or he'll do stand up work. I just love the idea that there's no barrier that you know, I'm in the Wadokai as we know we're we're training for some black belt dan tests coming up and these are like, you know, some of the core black belt dan tests that you can try and pass with the with the mainstream Japanese karate. And that's still fine because that is part of the art and the tradition and, yes. and there's a, a really important knowledge base there. But that doesn't mean that we can't learn more, you know, or, or and nice thing about being outside Japan, it's freer. We're more, there's more relaxed to, to do what we want to do. Yes. Um, I know that my, um, my friend, Hey, John uh, Fonseca in Chicago, how are you doing? Uh, I read, I was another reading, shout out. that's another <laughs> shout out. I know that he, I was reading, uh, I don't know where it was on his Facebook page or something, but he's studying Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And then George Kotaka, who, um, uh, you know, um, these guys aren't close friends of mine, but we know each other um, in Hawaii. He, yes. George is very famous, yes. three-time world champion. And he was here on the island, uh, Vancouver Island, here with seminar last year. Yeah. He also does Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these guys are cross-training and, and you, know, um, you know, obviously doing groundwork that, that's not common in, in, in the karate world. So it's great. We have to do it. Yeah. And uh, another segment could be Coach's Corner because these are some awesome stuff, I right? Like that. There we go. Right on, man. This is fantastic. Man. Uh, I did think of something we could talk about in in Atsuko, some of you know uh, um, those who have who have passed away and left us. Okay. And uh, did you ever meet Ryan Jimo? No, no, I did not meet Ryan Jimo, but I'm I'm familiar with his story. Yes. Yeah. So um, he was a karate athlete. And he competed at, at the nationals. Now, and someone else there can was he from New Brunswick? Was that it? Or I can't remember exactly. Yeah, I'm really sorry if I get it wrong. Um, because I only saw him compete once, um, but he uh, unfortunately um, passed away in the summertime. Yes, that's right. And um, he had um, been in the UFC. Yep, he had his yep, debut. Yep, fought in the UFC. That's right. And uh, um, uh, a lot of people in the karate world, you know, especially here in Canada, were really cheering him on to see that this guy was going for his dream. And so yes. it's kind of a shocker that you know um, that uh, that he's left us so early. And, uh, um, you know, it's an unfortunate altercation that happened. And so, uh, obviously our, our warm thoughts and go out to everybody in the community and his family and stuff. Absolutely. Um, but w I hope that other people who have that dream and hope everybody in the karate world who, who want to see who, those people who want to make a shot for it and go for it, that we support them and give them their best, Yes. you know, and, uh, he opened some doors for people, obviously from our country in terms of going towards the UFC and show that they can do it. So, yeah. No, it's great. Right on. Well, yeah. I mean, we've already over an hour already here. This time over is an hour. By when Holy we're talking cow! About. Just absolutely crazy. 
Um, yeah, so uh, again, this is Karate360. Um, what we're going to do at the end of the podcast is we're just going to talk a little bit about upcoming tournaments, things that are that are coming up. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll let you take that one away. Oh, yeah, I'll talk about the local ones. And we'll talk about the, uh, and on the WKF list. Sure, yes. All right, so uh, we're on the West Coast, and let's give a big shout-out to the West Coast Open. It's going to be on October 16th in Washington State. You can find out uh, more information on their website. Um, we're trying to organize a, a whole bunch of people here from our club to go over to it. Yeah. And we've already booked some hotels and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let's support our friends uh, in Washington State at the West Coast Open. Um, we'll definitely give a shout out to more more clubs in the area when they when they write into us. Yes. Um, there's obviously the British Columbia Open December 10th, uh, the Richmond Olympic Oval in Richmond, right beside the Vancouver Airport in Vancouver. Um, and uh, I'm the event promoter for that. So yeah, definitely everybody. Um, come and enjoy that experience as a one-day event. Um, it's also a point event, a Grand Prix point event for everybody who's the lead athlete in British Columbia trying to make the BC team. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, you read out the WKF list. No, I'll close with the big one. Okay. So just a couple of WKF tournaments coming up. So um, right now for us recording this, it's Friday, September 16th. This weekend, this is available on Monday, so it'll already have happened, but we'll talk about it on the next one, is the Karate One Premier League in uh, Fortaleza, Brazil, this weekend, September 17th and 18th, as well as next weekend in Hamburg, Germany, Karate One tournaments. Uh, in October, we got one in Okinawa, Japan, in uh, October 1st the and 2nd. Birthplace of Karate. There we go. And the World Senior Championships in Austria, this year October 25th to the 23rd and then we get into November November 21st to 22nd pardon me 21st to 28th is the AKF Junior Cadet Under 21 Championships in Indonesia so wow. there's uh, some tournaments coming up in the WKF world let's go see these one at a time so what was the first one you read out first one was the Karate One Premier League this weekend 17th and 18th in Brazil in Brazil okay I think it was a different time of year last time um in Rio? Nope, in Fortaleza. Fortaleza. Okay, so that'll be quite interesting because we've just had the uh, the junior PKF one. Yes. So this is more of a K1 for the older athletes. Yep. Um, yeah, so it, it'll be interesting to see what the results are like. Um, and what's the next one? Um, another K1, 23rd and 25th of September in Hamburg, Germany. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I think I saw on Facebook a bunch of Canadian athletes planning to go to that one. Yes. Yeah. Um, and maybe they're arriving a little bit early. Uh yeah, so that'd be quite interesting. It, this must be a prep tournament. I know that Istanbul normally is a prep tournament for um, the world, and maybe the German one obviously will be. Yes. Okay. And then October 1st and 2nd, the Karate One Premier League, Okinawa, Japan. Yeah, that. Well, let's see. The Okinawa one has been moving around, right? Like it was in November yeah, last yeah. year. And then the year before, maybe it was in the spring. Because I, I was supposed to, I remember there was a plan. That I was, yeah, I think it might have been. Um, Earlier in the year, because in 2014, there was a plan to promote Sunny Leeds um, for me to go to that event and promote it. Um, but they didn't, I think it might have been the first or second time they were hosting it. They weren't sure how many athletes were going to be there. Right. Um, but yeah, this is quite interesting because it's in the birthplace of China. Maybe there'll be more Asian athletes going to it from right. the, you know, uh, the AKF, right, uh, right. the Asia uh, Karate Federation area, which that would really, uh, does that include, it goes from Iran right over to Japan, right? Right, so this right. There's a quite a, a broad spread there. Yeah. And then the Worlds. The every World Senior Championships. Every yeah. two years, the uh, World Karate Federation Championships hosts, uh, the World Karate Federation hosts the World Championships, which is a requirement to be uh, IOC-recognized international federation. We right. have to hold an event every two years, um, which, you know, skateboarding has to catch up to you right now. <laughs> um, and... Uh, um, See, the very first one was held in 1970 in Tokyo. This is to, this was 2016. There'll be 2018. Then there'll be 2020. That'll be 50 years since the first one. So this is the 46 years since the the very first one was held. Yes. So let's go. Let's do a podcast right from there. Let's do it. Let's fly over there. Yeah, let's do it. Why not? Equipment's easy. Yeah, we can have other know. people teach the classes and do that sort of thing. Let's do it. 
And then again, just uh, in November, finishing off for the WKF is the AKF, actually, Junior Cadet Under-21 Championships in Indonesia. That's awesome. Did you know I just read about Indonesia was uh, there is a political party that's either in power. It's, I think it's in power, trying to get into power. Um, no, it must be in power because they're putting forward a resolution to ban the sale of alcohol in all of Indonesia. Wow. And Bali is a very popular, I've been there, Bali is a very popular place for people to travel to. Yes, it is, yes. And if there's um, no uh, spirits, uh, people might not go, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's true. I just uh, just remembered, um, actually, Indonesia is, there's a lot of interest, including Tunisia, um, but I remember when I'm doing my research for my PhD in um, support for, for peace, uh, working on um, how sport helps um, uh, people overcome wars and conflict yes, in yes. post-conflict society. Yep. And there was a guy, he w- had escaped from Cambodia um, during uh, the whole craziness with after Pol Pot, uh, no, uh, the Khmer Rouge. And um, so go, a lot of people had escaped, got over to Indonesia, kind of like boat people, and they're in these big camps, and all the men are drinking, and they're gambling, and, and the guards having a horrible time with them, right? And this uh, one guy from Cambodia had, had studied karate, so he's training karate on the beach, and he didn't smoke, and didn't drink, and he's very polite, and, and the guards were like, can you... They brought him over and said, can you just train these guys? And so he started training some guys and training more guys. He said, eventually on the beach, like 2,000 of them doing karate. Uh-huh. Like, if you want to learn karate from me, you're not allowed to drink or smoke uh-huh. or gamble. And um, the uh, the guards gave him a pass so he could like leave and stuff like that. Yeah, that was in Indonesia. Okay, the last one. Let's bring it on. Uh, again, Canada Open Karate Championships, June 3rd and 4th, yes. 2017, Richmond Olympic Oval. We want to make it the biggest tournament in Canada. Ever that yeah, biggest tournament that's ever happened in Canada. Yes. Yep. Um, be the first Canada Open champion, and that means open, so anybody can go to it. Yes. Um, come and experience it in uh, with WKF rules. Um, we have some really fantastic people here in BC that are working on organizing it with me, and and uh, I, it's just gonna be the the venue is fantastic. You know, one whole side of the Olympic Oval is a glass. Uh, wall that you look at the North Shore Mountains. Yes, yeah, you know, yeah. so you don't feel like you're locked in a, an arena or a gym all day. Mm. Um, yeah, there'll be one, something for everybody. There is going to be a flying sidekick contest. There we go. Have you ever been in a flying sidekick contest? Uh, only do- in the dojo. In dojo. Okay, so a flying sidekick contest. Here's how it goes. We get um, high jump poles. Okay. So you know, for the high jump, the leap over, right? Sure. So high jump poles get set up, um, and. Uh, you run and jump, clear the high jump pole. You have to do a side kick. Any type of form is fine. Mm-hmm. And obviously, it's sideways. There's a, uh, a, st- a staff person holding a kicking shield. You have to hit the kicking shield and not the staff member. <laughs> and l- I will not be holding that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you have to land on your feet without bouncing away. Okay. Okay? So you have to jump, clear the pole, land on your f- hit, the, hit the shield, land on your feet, and you're kind of already steady, right? And if you clear, then what they do is they, they do it by age group. And then so wh- after everybody clears it, then they raise it up, you know, a half a centimeter or a centimeter sure. or whatever, and you go up. And I remember one time um, uh, Curtis Gerlinger, he's from Vancouver, he's a former BC team athlete. Hey, Curtis, how you doing? Shout out to you. Um, he cleared, it must have been just under six feet. Oh. Like, because I'm, I'm in shoes six feet, you know, with my uh, four inch heels, <laughs> and uh, and like he, it like almost six feet. He he got such really good height, and then I remember, I mean, tons and tons of kids did it, right? They we, we would do their kata and kumite competition, and then we would have flying side kick competition. It was great because you could run on the side, you didn't need a ring. And uh, I remember this guy, like it was like men over forty division that we had too. This guy was fifty two, and he cleared just under where Curtis had done it. Whoa. 52 years old is fantastic and he had beautiful sidekick wow. was like he's like oh i used to train it forever back in the <laughs> 70s you know in this like old recreation center yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. yeah so there it is can open june 3rd and 4th and everybody thanks a lot for listening into uh the second episode of uh karate 360 we really appreciate it it's an absolutely great and again anything that uh, comes to your guys mind if you have any questions or things to talk to write to us email us check us out on twitter facebook 
and uh, just let us know. Let us know what you're thinking, let your thoughts on the podcast, things you want us to say, anything like that. Shout outs, upcoming tournaments. We want to hear from you and Absolutely. make it happen. Yeah. So if you've been, if you're one of these events we're talking about or a big event we're talking about and you've been to it, send us something about it. If you want us to give a shout out to your tournament or you've got a big seminar or something like that, absolutely let us know other than that everybody it's been fantastic again thank you kaylin thank you richard all right we'll see you guys a week from now absolutely everybody what's guys on thanks for all your great work out there and uh listen looking forward to next week thank you this is karate 360 us us